Mr. Andrew Browning. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm well, man. Thanks for having me. Awesome. I like your I like your farm, but we were just talking. You said you're at a hotel today. <laughs> I'm in a hotel today, but that is, that is uh, the family farm out in uh, northeastern Maine, and uh, it's a it's a good spot. Awesome. Yeah, it's a beautiful part of the world. Um, so you're uh, you did, you do actually? I think you said you were you were kind of born and raised in Connecticut, moved out to Santa Monica, which is a beautiful place. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. You have the new album coming out, "Love Is a Beautiful Thing," on November twenty second. Um, I was just checking that out. That's really great. Um, kind of, I guess, Americana rock, or how how would you describe? It? Yeah, you know, yeah. So uh, there, there. This album, I think, is more rock than Americana. But yeah, I would say sort of Americana rock. And there are definitely, you know, a couple of couple of country songs on there. But um, yeah, this is it, it's sort of more on the rock side this time around for sure. Yeah, and it's great. You have the, the Hammond in there, and that that kind of sound that I love that's really dear close and dear to my heart um so tell me about so you grew up in Connecticut what made you move out to California Santa Monica and do that whole thing you know I, th I think look I mean I grew up in a very sort of uh conservative uh country club Ronald Reagan-esque area and um I uh I, I think as a kid, I thought, well, it doesn't matter where I wind up, but I can't stay here. And uh, so, you know, I just put a guitar on my back and hit the road. And, you know, from a very early age, I don't know how I got to it. I just knew I had to be in L.A. where the sunshine and the pretty girls were. And, you know, maybe I caught that from TV. I don't know. But uh, I certainly throughout my entire high school experience, uh, that was what I had my focus on. And, you know, I used to wake up in the morning and look at the sky, you know, look at my ceiling and say, oh, it's not over yet, but I'm one day closer. And I didn't even go to my high school graduation. I mean, I finished my last high school exam and got an, on an airplane that day and moved to L.A. and never looked back. Wow. Yeah, that, that took some guts. <laughs> say, yeah, I didn't really think of it at the time. But looking back, it probably, you know, if my kids decide to do that, I might think twice about it. Yeah. Well, the, and of course, the California image and also all the great music that's come out you know, of California, that area in particular, Southern California, um, is very seductive. Of course, you're a young guy. And when, when did you actually start playing music and getting into that? Like, when did that start for you? Like, you know, I think I like most kids or, you know, or some kids, I guess, you know, I had a um, in elementary school, right? They had a music program. And um, of course, those are sort of drying up now. But, you know, generally speaking, like, you know, they throw you to musical instrument in third grade or something, see if it sticks. And so I, I took uh, violin lessons and I didn't like that too much. And then I think in fourth grade, I had some saxophone lessons and I didn't like that too much. And then I got a guitar in my hands and, you know, discovered rock and roll. And I went, ah, that's the thing. Now, looking back, if, you know, if I had better sense, I'd have kept the violin and the saxophone going as well. But I just decided those were painfully uncool and that having a guitar in my hands was better. Yeah, there's nothing like a, vi a beginning violin player. <laughs> it's a little rough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kind of like clarinet, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> that sounds like cats fighting in the alley. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah. Great instrument, though. Not putting down any violin players out there. Oh, yeah, so no. um, who, were, who were some of your like really early musical influences? You know, I really, um, I really got a lot of um, sort of the folk and country stuff early on. Um, we had a music teacher who was in elementary school, this kind of like hippie lady, and she had sort of like a jumbo guild guitar, you know, and the long hair and the flowery, you know, all that stuff. And, uh, you know, we used to get all, you know, sing like the Bob Dylan and the Simon and Garfunkel and, you know, there'd be Willie Nelson songs and things like that. And so that sort of like singer-songwriter uh, you know, folk stuff was some of the first stuff I ever got. And, um, you know, as I went through sort of growing up and playing different styles of music, it didn't really matter what the style was. I always figured that you had to have songs and, and they had to tell a story. And that's sort of, you know, how it's been my entire my entire life. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's the thing. Like, I, that's something I felt on your album, um, the songs that I was checking out, like they're story songs. Yeah. Yeah, and that that's uh, that seems to really be like a, a touchstone for a lot of. Uh, I don't say again. I don't want to put you, put your old you with Americana rock, but like that that kind of in, in country as well. Like it's about the story and the song, and and do you find like that's something you always gravitate to first? Like that's the most important thing, or what do you think? You know, I think the I. 
I think the way I do it, and it's probably not different from the way a lot of people do it, is I got, you know, we'll see if my background will allow me to show this. I got, you know, a handy little, can't really see it, iPhone, and it's got that little dictation software on it, right? So basically my writing process is usually with a guitar, and usually I'm sort of hammering out a melody, and, and oftentimes, you know, like a phrase will come to me, or I will have heard somebody utter a phrase, and I'll write that down. But it's a very sort of like scratchy sort of process um, where I have my iPhone and I'm sort of just trying to bang out ideas and I'll, I'll do tons of them and not look back on them. And then, you know, or eventually I'll look back on them, but I don't look back on them immediately. And, you know, I'll filter through them. I'll say, oh, that's a cool phrase or that's a cool melody. And I build everything off of that. But as I go through it, the end result is that there has to be a story there. So that may come from a phrase. It may come from an idea. Um, you know, it's hard to say, you know, where they come from, it, you know, some, sometimes they're from experiences, but sometimes they just craft something out of nothing. Yeah. It's just kind of a gift, right? <laughs> People, you kind of, it comes down to you like the, <laughs> I, I think, you know, I, I, I wish I could call it in my, my sense of gift. I, I think, you know, there, and there, that, that expression, do, do I write the song or does the song write me? Right. Exactly. Sometimes what it is, is. You know, I, I get out the the glue and I put a lot of it on the chair and a lot of it on my backside and I sit down and I don't get up until I got something. That's that's basically how it goes. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing too because you know musicians, especially songwriters, people think, oh, it's just a magic thing that happens. It's like, no, it's actually work. You know, and and also like you really hear that story in Nashville a lot where they do like songwriting appointments and that kind of thing, which is not right for everybody. But but you got to sit down and do the work, right? What, what's your that's kind of is that how it's been for you, like really focusing on having to be disciplined and get it done? Yeah, I think it is. And uh, you know, I I think you know, like most writers, every once in a while you get struck by lightning and you know this great thing comes down and it didn't take you much work at all and you know it's done in fifteen or twenty minutes. But I think most people find that. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work and, and discipline. And um, and oftentimes, I think I've found that a lot of the songs I like best or the ones that I think are the best are probably the ones that were the most difficult to write because it was just a lot of, you know, slogging through the, the mud and the rain and everything sort of to get there. And oftentimes, you'll finish a song like that. You go, nah, this ain't the thing. You know, I'm not feeling it. And then you come back to it and Maybe you practice it with a band or you arrange it and you go, wow, this thing's actually got, you know, legs and I didn't think it had them. Absolutely. Yeah. And you never, again, do like sometimes the best songs ever written took five, 10 minutes. You just, you just never know how that's going to go. I think. Um, yeah, you, yeah. Uh, tell me about the producer. Cause you've actually, I was reading kind of your bio and you have actually worked with some really interesting producers. Yeah. So um, on this record and the last two, I've been working with Derek O'Brien. And so um we played together in a band years ago, and then I hadn't seen him for a long time. But uh, he's sort of, you know, speaking of Huntington Beach, uh, he's from uh, he's from uh, Fullerton. And, oh, okay. Uh, he is, you know, he was the drummer for Social Distortion. He was in Agent Orange. He was, you know, every one of those every one of those old time punk bands he did a stint in uh, in the early days, and um, so that's sort of where he's coming from. And and I think we get. Um, you know, he adds sort of that little bit of punky element that sticks out in a lot of these songs, which I think is really great. And uh, we, have, we have a really good working relationship together. He's a, you know, fantastic drummer uh, and, and, and a really great producer. And, uh, you know, we bounce, we bounce off of each other really well. Awesome. And what, what's um, collaboration? Like, how important is that for you? I mean, in the studio or, or just songwriting, is that a, has that played a big part in what you're doing? You know, generally speaking now, the writing is is entirely me, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, throughout my life, I've had, you know, songwriting collaborations, I think, as, you know, a lot of songwriters find. Oftentimes, it's really difficult and painful and, and doesn't yield much fruit. And then every once in a while, you write with somebody where you're like, man, this is just so easy and so good. Um, and I've had both of those. Uh, but, yeah, currently, all this stuff, I write 100%. And then... You know, once I've got, you know, if I'm doing an album and let's say an album's eight or 10 songs, you know, maybe I'll have like 20 or 25 that I'm winnowing down and fleshing out. And then once I have a really good sense of it, you know, I'll I'll bring them into Derek and we'll sort of start putting them together and sort of uh, we'll listen to them well 
you know, hey, you're playing it this way, but maybe we could try it this way. You know, maybe let's do, you know, a, you know, instead of a shuffle, do a waltz or something like that. And then, um, so yeah, I, I mean, I guess the way it happens, you know, I, I do a few versions of something on my iPhone. Then I'll do it on my sort of home studio, right? Where I'll sort of be throwing in different melodies and different ideas where I'm like, you know, there's a motif that's yeah, got kind of fleshing it out. And then uh, move over and start working with Derek on it. And generally what we'll do is we'll do pre-production on it. So we'll arrange the songs, figure out, you know, what the feel is going to be on them, um, what all the parts are going to be. And then we'll do, we'll do the entire album in pre-production. And then we'll do, a, you know, uh, rinse and rinse that out and see where we are. And then we'll finally get to where we, you know, lay it down and make the record. So, um, there, there's a good part that's sort of all me locked up in my room and in my studio. And then, uh, th then sort of the second half of that is very collaborative. And then when we're getting, you know, the players in, you know, we, we definitely try to have, uh, input from them as well. Right. Um, so that they have some feel as though that they, they have some agency, Right, and some ownership and in, in a little bit in the music yeah, and the, in the yeah, process right. for sure sure um so do you are you are you touring i know you mentioned you're in a hotel room now are you touring a lot or what what's what's that for you these days yeah well I'm, we're working on some dates right now so the the second half of the year um will be out and uh so we're just finalizing that um it'll probably be mostly the western united states if i can make it work financially there will be other places right but um you, you know how it goes, right? It all comes down to what what what's financially viable and makes sense. Yeah, it's challenging, and you know, I think after post COVID, I know even for my I'm a musician as well, and even after that happened, like a lot of clubs kind of closed down and never reopened, which has made it challenging for singer songwriter touring bands um, to try to find venues that like said that makes makes financial sense to take a band on the road, which is expensive, right? Oh yeah, because you know I'm bringing like uh, six people out, right? You know they got to get per diems they got to get the hotel they got to get fed right they watered and you know i'm not the type of guy who's like you know you know hey i can't really afford to pay but can i give you this bag of weed you know i make, I make sure, I make sure that, <laughs> like the good old days <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. i make sure when we go out that i can pay everybody and i i make sure i'm paying them you know at least scale right you know so that um everything's transparent right because you know, if you if you take a gig with me, right, there's an opportunity cost there that you're not taking with somebody else, right? So that's really important to me. Uh, you know, if I come home and I've broken even personally, I can live with that. But I don't want anybody to come home with me and feel like they can't pay the rent or, you know, they've lost money on it. So at the, at the bare minimum, I got to be able to pay everybody. And, you know, ideally, I'm making some money myself. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's and good for you, you know, because, yeah, you those guys are kind of going through it with you on the road. It's it's a battle <laughs> at times. Yeah. So you want them to feel like they're they're in it for uh, that. They're going to survive and they're going to be good and take care of their families. So that's that's really awesome. Um, what's some advice that you can give to younger artists, singer songwriters, some really important things that you've learned along the way? Um, you know, I think, I think the biggest thing, right. For any artist and, and it's the hardest thing to be is, is authenticity, right. To be a hundred percent yourself, because man, it is really easy. You get out there and people say, oh, if it only sounded a little bit more like this, or could you add a little bit of that in there? And the, um, yeah, so that's the toughest thing. You just got to be a hundred percent authentically yourself and and you know from the time where we're born from the time we're toddlers right society sort of trains us to put on a mask right? right and and to be an effective artist you have to take off the mask and i think that's the hardest thing for any human being to do and it's the hardest thing for any author to do so or any artist to do so i would say that that's the main thing learn how to be authentic, learn how to be the person behind the mask and to put that out there. Yeah. And it takes bravery, right? To be oh. willing to, to it's, you're naked in front of the world <laughs> pretty much. And often, yeah, and oftentimes like you're naked in front of the people closest to you, right? Who you may perceive to be your harshest critics. They may not be, but you may perceive it, right? Because oftentimes like that mask we're putting on, that that whole costume is partially for the people that we're closest to. Right. right? Yeah. 
And, and I think that's the hardest part. I think that's the hardest part. Yeah, they want you to be successful, and you feel you feel even though they may be not putting pressure on you, you feel the pressure. <laughs> it's still oh. it's still there, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I I think um. Let's actually talk about how you're going to release the album. Is it going to be on the usual streaming platforms? What's your sort of your plan for that? Yeah. So I I actually have a really good story for this. So um, I, you know I have. I, I release everything on my on my independent label AHB, and um, up until recently, TuneCore was my distributor. So, as I was going through all the rigmarole with TuneCore, um, I got this stuff up there, and then I got a like a nasty gram back from them, saying, uh, "Yeah, we can't distribute this I, I, over content objections." I'm like, content objections. This is like pretty rated G stuff. So I thought maybe they didn't like the album cover or something like that. So I'm going back and forth with them. And, um, you know, and, and and I'm getting this sort of email from this person at TuneCore named Naomi. And she's like, oh, well, we can't tell you why we're rejecting it specifically. We're just telling you we refuse to distribute it. And uh, moreover, we're pull pulling this other thing down as well. And so my knee-jerk reaction was like, this Naomi is like the commissar of TuneCore, who's like, you know, <laughs> over-educated with, an, you know, from Smith or Sarah Lawrence or something. Right, exactly. <laughs> and I, think, I think the unfortunate thing is, is it was probably actually like a large language model bot trained on that data set responding to me. Yeah. Um, I got no response for them. So I actually um, got turned on from a friend who has a punk rock record label to a distributor out in Nashville, um, who's a guy who's a distributor at Sony for his entire career. And now he's got sort of like an independent distributor uh, business. And so I'm, I'm dealing with him, which is really great. So what I don't have is like 24 hour seven access to my di distribution dashboard. What I do have is a guy who has somebody from Spotify, somebody from Amazon, somebody from Apple, all of these people on speed dial. So if there's any shit I got to put up with, he can make that telephone call. And that's really been just a lifesaver. So, um, so yeah, I have a new distributor and, uh, and he was like, oh man, some of the titles I've released over the years, he's like, don't worry, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to kill you for a song title. You got to be kidding. Me. Yeah. But right. I, have, I really have no idea why uh, I caught all this shit from TuneCore, but basically I went, okay, well, I'm just gonna move all my business off your platform and that's it. Um, right. And and so that's it. And, and you know, I've heard the, the horror stories of, you know, some of the other digital distribution platforms and things like that. Um, and, and so, yeah, I'm just glad I got a human in the loop and, you know, it's not as responsive as having a dashboard all to myself, but I do have a person who has people and, and, and it's a great relationship. Yeah, and I mean, you you want to feel like you know you're talking to a human. I mean, that we've all dealt with the social media challenges where you, it just bots taking stuff down, and and like you said, there's no recourse, so it's just completely frustrating. And that's you know, this, these albums are your babies. <laughs> you want yeah. people, you want people to hear them. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and look, I you know, I'm I'm not making a king's ransom, but I'm certainly making a lot more than the actors who were striking a year ago. I was looking at their paychecks that they're posting online. I'm like, well, I'm doing a lot better than that. Um, uh. So the, uh, you know, my feeling is, is like, you know, I mean, TuneCore loses out on some percentage on that for not doing it. You know, I get somebody else now to to, to handle my, my streaming revenues and everything like that. But like, I just didn't understand how that was an effective business decision on their hand. To me, yeah, to me, I, I, I don't know why they did it. Yeah, and, and you know, unfortunately, we'll probably never know. <laughs> and then you think about all the other stuff that's out there. That's like, I mean, I'm not a prude, but I hear I hear some things out there, and I'm like, wow. And I actually, for me, I listen to everything, but you know, yeah, you kind of wonder why things happen the way they do. <laughs> um, how can people find you if they want to check out, um, like, you have a website, social media, all that stuff? Yeah, so the website is, uh, you can find us at andrewbrowning.net. So it's A-N-D-R-E-W-B-R-O-W-N-I-N-G.net. And then uh, Instagram is at nine pound hammers with, with a nine, the number nine. And then uh, on Facebook, it's Andrew Browning and the nine pound hammers. 
Awesome. I encourage everybody to check out your music. I really enjoy checking out the album. Um, I think it's going to do really well. Again, the album is Love is a Beautiful Thing. It's going to be out November 22nd, which is coming up <laughs> pretty quick. Yeah. yeah, we just happen to be doing this interview on Election Day, so today's going to be a little crazy. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining me. We had a little hiccup scheduling-wise yesterday because, unfortunately, airlines are not kind to me these days. <laughs> but I'm sure you know that story as well. Indeed, indeed. I really, really appreciate you having me, Daryl. Um, and I hope we get have, have the ability to get together sometime, hang out, and maybe play a little music. That would be awesome. Yeah. Well, let's stay in touch. And maybe next time I'm out in California, we can get, do a little bit of jamming. That would be fun. Sounds good, Daryl. Thanks so much for your time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thanks for joining us. And please consider subscribing to our podcast and follow us on our social media pages for guest announcements. 